Just straight up, everyone. I was watching one of my favorite YouTubers who actually doesn't make videos on Hinduism or Hindutva or any of these kinds of topics. He makes videos on cooking recipes in the rural village environment that he comes from. It's called Pat and Pat, and this guy lives in uh, a village in coastal Karnataka. He just makes videos in Kannada about cooking different dishes, and he's using the traditional implements that people have been using for a long time instead of, uh, you know, modern appliances and things like that. And he also goes out into his yard, cuts down, you know, leaves from a banana tree and, you know, other kinds of things. And he's made videos about, like, tamarind cultivation and uh, areca cultivation and things of this nature. And I was reflecting on this and also my own father's stories that he's told me because he grew up in the same kind of environment. Uh, he's also from coastal Karnataka and grew up in a village, and so he had that kind of intimate firsthand knowledge of, you know, the harvesting seasons and all of these different things that people did with different parts of plants and stuff like that. And also, if you're from a rural tropical region, something that you're also very familiar with is that you use parts of a plant that people typically don't use. For example, growing banana trees, not only do you eat the bananas, you also use the leaves as plates, which a lot of people are familiar with, but they also make a, a sabji out of the banana flower. They will make juice out of the trunk of the actual banana tree and things of this nature. So it's very interesting to watch this guy's videos, and I really sincerely hope that that he inspires people from other regions of Karnataka and other parts of India to do similar things with their own uh, environments and their own dishes. But the, the way that it's connected to topics that I care about is this. Once people move out of that rural traditional environment, trying to continue to uphold those values is very difficult because they're not naturally experienced by people in their day-to-day -day life. So this is what I mean. Someone like my dad would have grown up, you know, eating sabji, uh, banana flour, and things of this nature that I just described. But once it gets to my generation, which is just a generation later, now all I, I've never eaten these kinds of things. My only interaction with bananas is, you know, you go to stores and buy them. And yes, you can make, you, you know, using plantain as a vegetable and stuff. If you have access to those things, you can do that even in stores here and even, you know, banana flowers if it's available, so on and so forth. But that intimate knowledge of actually, you know, cutting down this tree and plucking this flower and knowing, you know, what time of the year does it come in bloom and when should you harvest it and all of that, that's totally lost on my generation. I just have the conversations and stories that I've gotten from my dad. That's the only way that I can uh, interact with it. And also seeing people like the Putt and Putt channel talking about it as well. But I don't have any firsthand experience of it. And not only do I not have firsthand experience of that, in an even more extreme uh, case, I live in a climate that's radically different from the climate that my ancestors are from. I mean, my dad is from coastal Karnataka, which is basically tropical. My mom is from southern England, Karnataka, which is uh, less tropical, but still hot and uh, and so on. But I live, I was born and raised here in the Midwestern United States where we have, you know, sub-freezing temperatures for several months of the year because we experience true winters and stuff like that. So even even the lived experience of living in the climate that my ancestors have always lived in and experiencing the passage of time and the passage of seasons and years and months and stuff the way that my ancestors always have, I don't even have that, much less the actual experience of you know living rurally and interacting with the plants so on and so forth. So it's it's very important that these kinds of things get passed down to the next generations. Because the other thing is, if you're if you're a second generation person living here in a Western country, and your parents didn't grow up in a rural area, they grew up in urban areas. 
they don't even have a lot of that kind of first-hand knowledge either because they didn't grow up in a rural environment. They grew up in a city environment. So a lot of this stuff has to come from people purposely keeping it up. Now, I've mentioned before the issue of cows and cow protection. And one of my early videos, I discussed this, where this is also related to the cow issue in the sense that in India, especially in the heartland where the dairy consumption is high and so cow ownership is high and things like that, people are interacting with cows, at least rurally or semi-rurally, people are interacting with cows on a very regular basis. People are consuming dairy products coming from cows that they know, you know, they're going out to the shed and making sure that it's not leaky and stuff so that the cow has shelter when it rains. They're interacting with the cows in a way, you know, you could always almost compare it to how people in the West interact with their dogs and cats. You know, you have names for the cows, you know, who, you know, when they had calves and all of this kind of stuff, right? It's very intimate, very involved. And, you know, you do go puja for them with Tilak and the Alas and the, you know, Agarbati and all of this kind of stuff. Now, if you're living that kind of lifestyle, the idea that cows are sacred and they should be worshipped and they should not be harmed, that's very natural and normal to you because that's how you're living your daily life, right? Now, many of those people may never have actually spoken out loud the sentence, I worship cows for this reason. Or in Hinduism, we consider cows sacred for you know, reason X, because it says so in the Bhagavad Purana or something like that, many of these people would have never actually said these things out loud in a conversation or when questioned or something like that, but they really don't need to because they're living a lifestyle where that, uh, that belief, that principle, that value is expressed in their day-to-day -day life, right? Now, when you come here to the Western world, that's not part of your lived reality at all, right? People in the West consume lots of dairy products, but they're not actually interacting with cows, right? The dairy products people consume here in the West are just coming from factory farms where cows that are treated terribly, living awful, restricted, extremely unnatural uh, lives, um, you know, it's it's very mechanical in the sense that the same kind of uh, emphasis on efficiency and the bottom line and uh, highest yield and so on and so forth that, that dictates how they approach like corn production and wheat production and soy production, they do the same thing with dairy and eggs and meat as well, which obviously leads to an enormous amount of the abuse of animals uh, in this process. But, you know, the greater point is that because people don't live a lifestyle where they're interacting with cows in this kind of reverential, thankful, familiar, familial kind of way, the idea that cows are sacred and a motherly figure and shouldn't be eaten and should be protected, this is a value that really needs to be purposely taught and inculcated within the second generation because it's not a part of the normal lifestyle. If a value is lived out in your lifestyle, you don't need to purposely teach people, you know, formally, okay, this is why we do this, this is why we believe in this, so on and so forth, right? Now, even more broadly than this, in Hinduism or, uh, you know, any traditional religion, you see a lot of emphasis on the fact that um, nature is sacred, right? It's not just cows, it's also other animals that we consider sacred. It's also bodies of water, it's mountains, it's the sun and the moon and all of these kinds of things. Now, someone living a rural lifestyle understands these things also, right, very intimately, because rain to them is not something that makes it inconvenient to walk from a building to your car in the parking lot. Rain is something that helps grow the crops which you eat for sustenance and it helps you continue to survive, right? The sun isn't something that you look outside and you feel like it's a nice day because the sun is out and it's not raining. The sun is something that, again, the crops need to survive and you need, you know, for the crops need in order to grow and you need in order to survive the crops, right? 
So you can say these same things about the moon and all of these other things, right? And so the way in which we interact with nature living in a, first living in an urban environment, secondly living in the modern Western world, it's very kind of superficial and artificial. And so that lived reality of the sacredness of nature is really lost on people where this is, again, just like the cow issue, it's something that really needs to be inculcated. You can see this in the modern environmentalist movement. I mean, the modern environmentalist movement, from what I see, is, is quite um, just repulsive and disgusting, to put, to put it quite bluntly, in the sense that their idea of what nature and the environment is is so uh, fake. I mean, they're people that don't actually live in nature. They're not in touch with nature at all. They have just watched a bunch of videos and done research and understood that the environment has been, you know, polluted and degraded and exploited and so on, which is all true and it does need to be addressed. But you can see that it doesn't come from an honest kind of uh, natural idea coming from interacting with nature, right? You can see this kind of weird uh, emotionalism coming from the People we call tree huggers, right? They're extremely against cutting down any tree. They're just loud and obnoxious and irritating, just like any other leftist is with any of their other pet issues, whether it's feminism or, you know, protecting the rights of these minorities that they claim are oppressed or the LGBTQ movement or anything else. Whereas if you look at our tradition, we have a, specifically in, in relation to trees, we have a... Uh, kind of sampradaya, basically, within Hinduism called the Vishnoi, who are, I think they're from Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh or something like that. They are, they were known for protecting trees when the British or some uh, multinational company wanted to cut down a bunch of trees. They stood in front of them and prevented them from being cut down. They're, you know, they're very strict vegetarians. They're very big on tree protection and all sorts of other kind of nature related kinds of themes there's also some ideas of i think keeping bodies of water pure and stuff like that and you can see there are the perfect kind of blending of environmental protection true spirituality and a natural kind of lifestyle all coming together as one so the the basic point that i really want to drill home is that once people are separated from the environment and lifestyle out of which certain values in our Hindu dharma come from, we need to be very purposeful of, about inculcating those values into people purposefully because we can't just say, well, we never told people this in the past. Why wouldn't you need to tell people about it now? Because... In the past, people were just living that reality, that truth, out in their day-to-day -day life. There's no need to tell them, whereas now there is. So that's all I've got for you guys today. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Jai Shri Ram.